pleased to worship with Sister uh, Sister Slater at the uh, our, our book sharing on this. So excited to see uh, what's happening with that. Tonight, uh, 6.30, there will be an evening service here at the church. Uh, the morning service is the one that is live streamed. Uh, but it won't be live streamed in service tonight. And the, um, the morning service is live streamed. The morning service also has our discovery lamp on. So there is no discovery lamp. I'm going to read Revelation 12, verses 9 to 12. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And the river flows and it brings refreshing wherever it goes through the valleys and over the fields the river is rushing and the river is here the river of god sets our feet to dancing the river of god fills our hearts with cheer the river of god fills our mouths with laughter and we rejoice for the river is here the river of God is steaming with life, and all who touch it can be revived. And those who linger on this river shore will come back thirsting for more of the Lord. The river of God sets our feet to dancing. The river of God fills our hearts with cheer. The river of God fills our mouths with laughter, and we rejoice for the river is here. To the mountain we love to go To find the presence of the Lord Along the banks of the river we run We dance with laughter giving praise to the sun 
The river God sets our feet to dancing. The river God fills our hearts with cheer. The river God fills our mouths with laughter. And we rejoice for the river is here. My Savior's love, Murray. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned
our church elder to read scripture and lead us in prayer. Good morning. For the people online that did not hear anything Kevin said in the announcements, I just want to repeat that tonight is our first evening service at 6.30 tonight, and so I encourage you guys to come. Thanks. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the opportunity to come here and worship you. I pray today's service will be honor, honoring and glorifying to you and that we will all learn and come a little closer to you. Lord, please be with the Discovery Land leaders and children. Lord, I thank you for all of them and their dedication to that ministry. Lord, I thank you for the worship leaders up here and let them help us sing a joyful song to you. Lord, please place a hedge of protection around our church and all churches today. And Lord, be with Pastor Kevin today as he brings us your word, and let his words be your words. Lord, be with our congregation, be with the lonely, heal the sick, strengthen our marriages, bless our families, and help us know that you need to be the center of all our aspects of our lives. Lord, I thank you again, and today I pray for health and safety for this upcoming week. Please bring us back tonight and next week to corporately worship you. We pray all these things in your precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. And I'm going to read from Acts 8. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all played, paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and, exp and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. You are my everything, and I will adore you. 
roars of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Oh, holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. So the joy of technical difficulties. All that banter and only half the congregation heard it because it didn't come through live stream, right? And you know what the problem was? Is the AA batteries we put into my mic, my, my portable mic, were just a hair different in size than the ones that were in it before and wouldn't make connections. So all of that just because of the hair's difference on a battery. So. Thank you to our tech team for figuring it out and getting it all sorted out for us. And for those of you wondering what the announcements all were, go to our website, fortmcclawlionschurch.com, and read them online, and that'll be where you find them. So I want to continue reading with our scripture passage in Acts chapter 8. I'm going to continue from where Brendan left off, starting in verse 14 to verse 25, Acts chapter 8. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you said may come upon me. 
Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Lord God, I pray that as this sermon goes forth, Lord, I bring this forward as my act of worship. And I pray, Lord, that our ears and our hearts would be opened as our act of worship corporately. I pray where my words may lack clarity, you may bring clarity. And that we may hear from you this morning. Work within us that which is pleasing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. So it was in Samaria. Jesus and the disciples were there again in Samaria. They'd been there many times before. Jesus had once met in Samaria with a Samaritan woman at a well, discussing worship, and then he ministered to the community in Samaria, and it was almost like a revival as people responded, and they wanted to know about Jesus. Jesus would make the Samaritans a hero of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And now, Jesus is back there again with his disciples. You need to understand that the Jewish people didn't like Samaritans. The Jewish people during this time period considered them to have a compromised heritage. That the Samaritans were part Jewish and part something else. And they would literally take the long way around in their travels so as not to have to go through the Samaria and encounter any Samaritans. It's kind of like somebody today may be going, I don't like that person. I'm going to walk on the other side of the street. Jesus didn't do that. He went to Samaria on a number of occasions. He didn't take the long way around. He went through to minister to the people in Samaria. Only this time, when Jesus was there, in Luke chapter 9, it was a little different. This time he didn't receive the reception that he'd had previously. They actually told Jesus to leave town. They looked at Jesus and said, to, 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 to leave town, to, to send them away. James and John were part of this. And they were indignant. After all, for James and John, they probably would have viewed themselves as having stepping down in gracing the Samaritans with their presence. They saw themselves from this elevated standpoint, and now they were slighted. They went into Samaria, and Jesus went into one of the communities, and they said, go away. James and John came to the Lord and said this, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them. What an interesting story. What an interesting question. Well, surely Jesus is just as indignant about this rejection as the disciples were. They were in Samaria of all places. What were they doing sending them away? In their slight and state, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I want to ask you a question this morning. What would you do with spiritual power? I mean, Jesus once said that if we had the faith of a mustard seed, we could call this mountain and say to it to move from here to there. He said that, that all things are possible with God, that there's spiritual power in God. What would you do with spiritual power? Why would you want it? Why would you want God to show up in your situation with power? Jesus' answer to James and John. Scripture says he turned to them and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. We're not told what they thought afterwards, and we're not recorded anything they said. I suspect because Jesus said this, they were just quiet. But I could imagine, I can visualize or speculate a response. But Jesus, look at how they treated us. I mean, we want to go all Sodom and Gomorrah on them. Lord, bring the fire down. Look at how they treated us. Let them see what they have slighted. Thought of this passage in this story as I was looking at some of the Psalms this week. 
you know, in the Psalms are 78 times where the psalmist, and the Psalms are emotional responses. They're spirit-inspired emotional responses back to God. It's, it's God looking at us saying, I know there's days they're going to feel like that. And even if they know that truth is different, they need a way to express how they're feeling. And the Psalms become those emotional responses, inspired responses back up to God. Seventy-eight times during the, in the Psalms, the phrase enemies are referred to. Seventy-eight times the psalmist talks about enemies, being that they're enemies of God or my enemies. Be honest for a moment. Have you ever wished for God to show a display of power through you simply to silence the enemies? Have you ever sat back in whatever your situation and ever wished God to show a display of power through you to silence the critics? You know, those who have insulted your faith. Those who have maybe teased you or belittled you for being a Christian. Be honest, have you never thought, Lord, rise up in power. Show your power, and in the process, God, when you do that, I mean, I'm going to be looking pretty good because I'm with him. And the people around, they'll suddenly be influenced by me and my faith because of the power, God, that you have shown. I can imagine sitting back there, looking at somebody and saying, so, so what do you got to say for yourself now? Do you just see what God did? Why would you want God to show up in your situation this morning, with power. We're in Acts chapter 8 this morning. And Acts chapter 8 is a passage that deals with how we relate to power, how we relate to spiritual power, what our mindset is when it comes to issues of power and control. Acts chapter 8, we've been going through the book of Acts, and it shows us the powerful workings of the Holy Spirit. We've seen powerful preaching and people responding. We've seen Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit. We've seen signs and wonders. We've seen miracles. We've seen healings. We've seen the deliverance of the demonic. We've seen the mighty workings of God as we've gone through these early chapters in the book of Acts. The power of God through the people of God, the church. And whenever I go through Acts, there's part of me that is uncomfortable and uncertain. Should we be seeing the same kind of power in our midst today? Should we be seeing deliverance of the demonic? Should we be seeing miracles and healings take place? Should we see the kind of manifestations of the power of God that we see in the book of Acts continue to accompany the proclamation of the word of God today? As we read it, we may be particularly coming from a more conservative background have a sense of discomfort or uncertainty. And yet at the same time, part of us is also longing. God, we want to see this in our midst today. We want to see your power at work through your people today. Now it's God's to decide how he will act in which situations and which places. It is his to decide. But I will say this, I do believe that God would do more of this kind of activity amongst us if we were more open to this. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, we read this. And he, being Jesus, did not do many mighty work, works there, being his hometown, because of their unbelief. He didn't do many mighty works in his hometown because, it says, of their own unbelief. Not that he couldn't. Not that Jesus wasn't capable. We do not limit God. We do not control God by the quality of our faith. There's a false teaching out there that really is about faith and faith. It's not that Jesus couldn't have acted in the midst of their unbelief. It's simply that unbelief was not the environment that Jesus would choose to do his mighty works. Now, as Christians, we need to understand unbelief is different than doubt. We're struggling to believe. Unbelief is that adamant, I will not believe. This cannot happen. Whereas doubt is saying to God, I'm uncertain, but I'm open to how you would lead me and show me. I always empathize with the father of the child who was ill as Jesus was before him, 
wanting Jesus to act in his circumstance. And he cried out to Jesus. He said, I believe, help me in my unbelief. We've read in Acts chapter, in the book of Acts, the first seven to eight chapters, we've seen the mighty workings of God, the power of God. And we struggle with wondering, Lord, how much should we expect of this to continue in our time and place? And yet, in the background of this, we come to Acts chapter 8. And Acts chapter 8 stands as a warning for how we as God's people might relate to spiritual power. When you think of the mighty workings in the book of Acts, why would you want it? What is really behind what we may wish to see and experience? So we're back in Samaria again. And I'm envisioning John as he's traveling there with Peter, thinking back to his last time there with Jesus, when James and John were calling on God to use spiritual power to rain down fire from the heavens. Now James and John is on, his way, on their way back there again. And it's another story that has to do with spiritual power. Acts chapter 8, there's a number of layers in it. There's layers that challenge some of our Western sensibilities. There's layers that we wrestle with as we wrestle with some of the theology of coming to faith and receiving the Holy Spirit. And then there's layers in this chapter that provide us a warning on the posture in which we as God's people might relate to spiritual power. As much as I'd like to unwrap all of that, I'll have to be selective in the time that we have this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Acts chapter 8 starts in verse 4, where we're starting. And it says this, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And this is where we left off last Sunday. Those who were scattered. This persecution had come upon the church. And the result of the persecution and the suffering of the people of God Understand, the power of the Holy Spirit didn't prevent these persecutions and sufferings. Rather, God actually used their sufferings to further his purposes through them. God allowed an upset of the status quo among the church, among a settling people, in order to lead them more fully to live out God's purposes for them. God had called them. He told them, in, it, it, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1a, you will see power when the Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. They got that part figured out. The church was established in Jerusalem. The church was growing in Jerusalem. But Jesus had said they were to go from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, the people of God were settling in Jerusalem. They were not moving forward in the mission that God had for them. So he allowed the circumstances of the time to upset a settled people. I said last Sunday, when we look to God to do a new thing, we need to be prepared for him to move us away from the old thing because the two of them may not be able to coexist. They were scattered. The result of that, we have Philip in verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. Philip was one of the original seven deacons. We met him in Acts chapter 6. We saw how there had been this, this conflict that took place among God's people, and we saw the structures, the spirit-filled structures that were put in place to satisfy, to, to deal with that issue. Now, there's an aside to that as I, as I look at the progression of the book of Acts from chapter 6 through to chapter 8. One of the things that I realize with it is a, is a problem that they sought to solve in Acts chapter 6 was no longer an issue by Acts chapter 8. The church was scattered. And so even those original deacons were not fulfilling the role that they were originally called to do within Acts chapter 6 in Jerusalem. I think that's important for us to understand because sometimes 
situations resolve and sometimes circumstances change and needs change and we are left with the wisdom of an earlier approach. But it may be that we have to change something in the present. We need to hold on to structures loosely. The issues of Acts chapter 6 were no longer the same issues that were facing the church by this point. Philip, one of those original deacons, he had now been scattered. He had left Jerusalem and he had gone down to Samaria where he preached Jesus. He preached Jesus and his preaching was accompanied by the workings of God that brought about physical healing and deliverance of people from the demonic. And it amazed the people that were there. Now I want to take a side trip for a moment because we read some of these passages quickly and, and, and we, we miss them in our present context. The ministry that Philip was involved in included deliverance of people from the demonic. We sometimes wonder about that. We have questions about that. Over and over in Jesus' ministry, we see how there were those who it says in scriptures were possessed of an evil spirit. And we see in the book of Acts how people were delivered from this kind of oppression. The word possessed, actually, when speaking about unclean spirits or the demonic, the word possessed is probably not the best choice anymore for translating the words in Scripture. Our language and the meanings of our, our, within our English language, they change. The language that Scripture was given to us in is a dead language, and the, the words, the meanings of the original text of Scripture do not change, but within our English context, the words change. Right? When you were young, when you talked about an airbag, it meant a completely different thing than what comes to your mind today. English changes, and so sometimes we have to change the words that we use to better understand what Scripture was saying. The word possessed implies ownership. The word possessed implies ownership, and that's not what's firstly in view when the Scriptures talk about unclean spirits and their habitation within people. The Greek word here is a word that gets translated as demonized. And it means to possessed or oppressed or vexed. The idea of a spirit vexing somebody. And it carries with it the idea of being inhabited or invaded by a spirit. Philip's ministry, as he went down to Samaria, he encountered, not everyone he encountered, but some of those that he encountered were vexed or oppressed or inhabited by a spirit in some area of their life. Very few people are possessed in the sense that they are complete ownership of an evil spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 English Standard Version says this, and give no opportunity to the devil. NIV says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Another translation says, neither give place to the devil. And the word there, topos, is translated, can be translated as a place or a position or an opportunity. But usually in the scriptures where that word is used, it's referred to a literal place, a location. What we get from that as we look at Ephesians 4.27 and we look at it in the context of unclean spirits is the demonic does not have to have ownership to inhabit a territory or to inhabit a place in a person's life. The other thing to realize is Ephesians 4.27 that says, and give no place to the devil or give no opportunity or give no foothold to the devil. This was written to believers. This was written to Christians. Warning that Christians can give grounds for the invasion or the inhabiting of a spirit in a person's life. The word foothold, it's a military term. It means to take up, take up a location from which you establish a foothold of which you then spread outwards to infect other areas of a person's life. 
Acts chapter 5, verse 3, when we looked at Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias was a believer, and it said, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart? There was something that Ananias had done. There was some avenue in Ananias' life that he allowed the demonic to fill a portion of his life. Ephesians chapter 4, I would say this, be careful of long-standing anger. Be careful of roots of bitterness. Be careful of living with an unforgiving spirit. Sometimes this comes out of our lives from our natural fallenness. But when we remain obstinately in those angry places, when we remain obstinately continuing to live out of an angry place, sometimes we give grounds, we give a place for demonic activity in our life to infect our lives and leave us in spiritual bondage. For some people, all of life seems to be lived out of an angry place. And even Christians may need deliverance from this kind of bondage. Paul said this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give an opportunity, a foothold, a place, a grounds to inhabit to the devil. I'm not saying that all long-standing unresolved anger is a sign of demonic oppression or inhabitation. But sometimes, in some people's lives, when counseling avenues and where medical avenues have not helped with some of the destructional, destructive emotional issues in a person's life, we may need to be praying for discernment on other possible spiritual causes. Charles Swindoll puts it this way. He writes, the good news is that evil never has to win. Freedom from possession, obsession, oppression, influence, or whatever theologians want to call it, is freely available when Jesus Christ walks into a life. We read through these quickly when we're reading the Gospels and the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of his first disciples. We we read through these things quickly. When we're reading in the book of Acts and we see the ministry that took place there and how they engaged in the world and even amongst believers in the church, we see it quickly and maybe we dismiss it because in our Western mindset with our Western influences, we treat it simply as something that's science fiction, something that's out there. But the scriptures describe these as real experiences. And our lack of belief in the experiences described in the scriptures does not mean that they're not true. Philip is now in Samaria. He's being used by God to proclaim Christ, to minister through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is seeing lives change. He is seeing people come to Christ. He is seeing people healed. He is seeing people delivered from the demonic. And at this point, entering into the story is a man named Simon. As I studied this this week, the question is, why is this story in the book of Acts? What is the lesson the Holy Spirit wants to impart through this story of Simon? Many of your Bibles will say, Simon the magician believes. It starts in verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest. This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed him with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Acts chapter 8 enters this man named Simon, a man who had wowed people with a spiritual power that was not of God. He was a practitioner of magic. The words translated as magic arts or sorcery. And at this point, some of you are thinking, we're into science fiction now. What does this have to do with church? It challenges our Western sensibilities. But the Bible is clear. 
And it teaches that there are spiritual powers in this world and that there is spiritual activity that comes from God, from the Holy Spirit, and there is that which comes from the demonic. Now our society misunderstands who the devil is, who Satan is. The devil is not an equal opposite of God. Rather, the devil is a fallen angel who convinced others to join him in opposition to God in what the Bible now describes as the demonic. He is a malevolent evil, destructive and deceitful. But there are spiritual powers that exist there. Back in Exodus chapter 7, Moses was before Pharaoh. And Moses came and brought many miraculous signs from God before Pharaoh in trying to, to convince Pharaoh to let the people go free. To let the people of God go free. In Exodus chapter 7, Moses is before Pharaoh, and we read this, Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. So Moses would do a miracle through the power of God, and these magicians, these sorcerers of Pharaoh, would do similar things. As the story goes on, we see eventually they could not keep up with the power of God. The end is clear in Scripture. Revelation chapter 12 speaks about how finally, in the end, Satan is defeated. And that the powers of the demonic are defeated. And that for the people of God, they overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. 1 John chapter 4, 4 says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. And he's speaking about false prophets and spirits that do not confess Jesus as Lord. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. I know some of you struggle to accept some of this. Ephesians chapter 6, we read this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We look at things in our world and we tend to think it's just the people around us that cause the problem for us. It's situations that we can't control. And we don't recognize that there is a whole spiritual realm that affects our physical realm and affects us as people, both believers and unbelievers. The Bible describes this in one occasion in the Old Testament. One of the prophets was being surrounded by an army and his servants said was fearful. And this prophet of God said, those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. And his eyes were open and he saw the unseen armies of heaven surrounding them. There is more that exists than that which we simply see. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The Bible describes Satan as an angel of light. He's deceptive and he's attractive. You know, the power of a lie is this. You don't believe it's a lie. If you believed a lie was a lie, you wouldn't fall for it. The power of a lie is this. You believe it wholeheartedly to, tr to be true. And in sincerity, you follow the lie. Simon in Acts chapter 8 was impressed by spiritual power. Simon, in Acts chapter 8, was impressed by spiritual power that came through Philip's ministry, and he wanted this power for himself. In fact, he even wanted to purchase spiritual ability from Peter and John. Simon had lost his influence with the people. He had used his magic to amaze the people. People, because of his power, would defer to him. And now this greater power through the Spirit of God was present. And Simon wanted to purchase spiritual ability. He saw this as a new pathway of power. The Scripture says that he believes and is baptized. 
One of the theological dilemmas with Acts chapter 8 is, did Simon actually become a Christian? Commentators debate on this. But when we look at the fruit of his life, the fruit was not of Christ. James chapter 2, we read that even the demons believe and shudder. Not all faith is believing faith. Not all faith is saving faith. I do not believe that Simon came to Christ. He was a false disciple. He said the words, he was baptized, but what he was thirsting after was power to control, not the presence of God. Not all faith is believing faith. Simon did not want Jesus as Savior and Lord. He wanted spiritual power to manipulate others for his own purposes, to satisfy himself. He was a false disciple. He goes to Peter and John saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God and money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Tradition tells us that Simon went away from this and he went back to his magic and he borrowed Christianity to blend it with his magic to help form a heresy known as Gnosticism. I want to say this. Deuteronomy chapter 18, if we took the time to read it, you can look it up later. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 to 11 tells God's people to have nothing to do with any kind of spirituality outside of the God of the Bible. We as Christians are not to have part of any kind of spirituality or any kind of spiritual power outside of the God of the Bible, outside of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All such powers are evil and destructive. People enter into them through such things as Ouija boards, horoscopes, magic, occult, new age crystals and powers, incantations, mantras, chants, occultic role playing games, fortune telling, charms and superstitions, seances. The list can go on. People out of their curiosity and Christians out of their curiosity play with spiritual forces that are of the devil. And there are times that Christians become enslaved. They become in bondage because they give the devil a foothold in their life because with their curiosity, they play with something that they ought not to have anything to do with. Dear Christian, if you're listening, if you're here today and you're involved in that kind of stuff, then you need the words that that Peter and John said here, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart, you may be forgiven. If you are involved in anything like that, you need to turn from it. You need to repent from it. And you need to ask Jesus to free you from it. Because it will only lead you to spiritual bondage and destruction. There are a lot of theological implications I'd love to get into out of this passage, but I want to finish with focusing on an understanding of how we relate to spiritual power. Because that's really what Acts chapter 8, that's what it unwraps for us with this story of Simon and Philip. Dear people, understand as Christians, there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is spiritual power that comes through the working of the Holy Spirit through the people of God. The power is of God and not of us. And that's why Paul would say, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not of us. It's often out of places of weakness, out of places of being scattered, suffering, and persecution that the church finds itself as a medium for the power of the Holy Spirit to do his work. I read through the book of Acts and I see these displays of power. And I do wonder if there is something there for us. Acts chapter 16, there's a young girl who has what's called a spirit of divination, spirit of fortune telling. It's one place in the scriptures. I'm not big into, some of you have heard with some deliverance ministries naming all these different, I mean, you've got, you've got the spirit of this, the spirit of that, and whatever. 
And I'm a little skeptical of that. But here's one spot where a spirit is named. He's a, it's a spirit of divination. And this was not a hoax. Through unseen spiritual powers, this young girl had the ability to tell fortunes. And she acted disrupting Paul's ministry. And we read in Acts 16, verse 18, that Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. There is spiritual power in the name of Jesus. There is spiritual authority that resides within the Christian, not because of us, but because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that resides within us. Because of our inherited position as children of God in Christ. There is power in the name of Jesus. But Simon's story serves as a warning that our desire needs to be not for power, but for presence. The presence of Jesus. See, Simon wanted power from God without the presence of Jesus in his life. But the presence of Jesus is the power. People like all forms of power. You like power, whether you want to admit it or not. We like to have influence. We like to manipulate and control others for our own interests. We like a display that causes others to defer to us. Power in and of itself isn't wrong, but this misplaced desire for power, for control, is something that is not of God. And it leads to all forms of abuses. People misuse power, whether it be physical, mental, financial, or spiritual in nature. If we look at the book of Acts and say, God, give us the power in these days like the book of Acts, we are praying the wrong prayer and we have the wrong longing. It is so subtle. But James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven. They wanted spiritual power because they were slighted. They wanted it for their own interests. Simon wanted it to amaze the people and to influence the people towards his own agenda. Why would God give his people spiritual power? Dear people, it's the presence of God manifest in our midst that matters the most. Even in suffering, even without miracles, signs, and wonders, because the presence of God is the power of God. And it's within the presence of God that the possibilities of the activities of the book of Acts are possible, as well as the possibilities of living with peace and contentment without it is also powerful. We too often long for God's activity out of the wrong places. I'll give you an example as, as we move towards closing. Many Christians speak of victory. We sing songs like victory in Jesus. Many Christians speak of victory, that they want victory over something in their lives. That victory isn't a bad thing, but it's subtly misplaced. What is it do I want? I want victory in my life. Why do I want victory over something? in my life. Jerry Bridges, in a classic book called The Pursuit of Holiness, writes about the subtle ways we can become self-centered in wanting God's activity in our life. He writes this, we are more concerned about our victory over sin than we are about the fact that our sins grieve the heart of God. We cannot tolerate failure in our struggle with sin chiefly because we are success-oriented, not because we know it is offensive to God. God wants us to walk in obedience not victory. Obedience is oriented towards God. Victory is oriented towards self. It's a very subtle difference. Why do I want the power of God in my life? Why do I want the activity of God to flow through my life? So that I can be a successful Christian. So I can say, look, God, what you have done, and people defer to me. People see how great I am. Or I want the power of God so that I can live obe in obedience to the word of God and in do so reveal his presence. It's a very subtle difference. Why do I want spiritual power in my life? Why do I want God's activity in my life? To accomplish something, to make something happen that I can be proud of, to perform? 
or to reveal Jesus and watch him set the lost free. Exodus chapter 33, Moses is before God and he prays this. He doesn't pray for ability. He doesn't pray for power, but God's power is very evident throughout Moses' life and ministry. Moses prays this. He says, if I have found favor in your sight, Please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. What's Moses' heart? To find favor in the sight of God. God responds. He says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses again says this. He says, if your presence will not go with you, do not bring us up from here. The warning of Acts chapter 8 speaks to us of our relationship with power and the desire for power. And I want it this morning for us to understand that there is such a thing as spiritual power. There is spiritual power that comes from God. There is spiritual power in the demonic. And we need a greater sense of awareness of this. Some want power to make others stand up and take notice and don't really care about the source. Give me whatever I need so that I can control, so that I can amaze, so that others will defer to me. Some seek spiritual power, physical power, financial power. Some seek political power, and it's about control. And Jesus says to his church, not so among you. Power is not about our ability to control but it's about the presence of God being seen and glorified in our midst. Simon wanted power to make his desires happen. He wasn't interested in the presence of God. All of the spiritual activity we see in Acts, all the spiritual power we see in Acts, I do believe that God wants to reveal himself in these ways still, in the times and places of his choosing. But spiritual power is nothing without presence, without longing for the presence of Jesus amongst us, for it is his presence that is his power. Lord, if your manifest presence will not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For no amount of power, no amount of ability to succeed, to accomplish, or cause others to stand up and take notice is a substitute for your presence amongst us. Let the world look at us as humble servants of your purposes and be able to say, surely God is among you. Amen. presence and the power of God in my life. Why do I want God's activity? What's behind it? What is within my heart to see the power of God? To display, to control, to manipulate? Or God, use me however you want, in power or in weakness, to display your presence. That whether in suffering or in victory, the presence of Jesus might be seen for the glory of God. Please join us in standing.
Spirit go with you all. 